Hey. Hey guys. Hello. Hello. Uh, e Elon, Aiden. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> you suggested to do a quick uh, talk about the DX DAO. Yeah. Oh, maybe uh, yeah, we said at the end. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll just. Uh, I'll also. Do you have any slide to share, or just like talking on? Uh, I can share my screen, and I'll probably just go through the DAO itself. Okay. So I'll I'll just add you as a co-host, so that you know when you want to present, you can also share the screen. Sure. Yeah, so this session is kind of quite open-ended and uh, I don't know if it could go lots of heated debate or it's, I don't know what's going to happen <laughs> because people love to talk about governance in general. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I got some, can you see, drink. If you guys want to grab like beer, wine, this is the time to do. I'll just wait for a few more minutes. A bit early for that here, I think. <laughs> but you can have your mead, right? Or, or are you moved on to beer? Oh, well, I have both available. It just seems like 7.01 a.m. is a bit early to be cracking one open. Yeah. I, I, I see New Zealand those drinking in those hours. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for the first two videos, I'm in the middle of uploading to YouTube and I think it's processing. So as soon as it's done, uh, I think I shared a playlist on uh, a Discord channel or somewhere, or I think I tweeted. So if you go there, you can actually start watching. And so I think now we have 18 people, so it's time to start. So like, uh, let me just share the screen first. Uh, someone just joined. Okay, let me share first. Okay, so this is a third session of the ENS workshop. And this is like a kind of general topic we talk about governance. So I saw, I put, we have a, each of team member have a bit to talk about bit. So like I will probably go first, go about kind of transparency on the revenue bits where, because I, I've recently playing a lot with uh, do analytics. So I have some visibility and uh, Nick can talk through uh, multi governance and Bradley also said he's working on some new way of governing uh, like across beyond just like ENS so he can talk about and yeah it, do I pronounce correctly Elon? Yeah Elon is fine I just I Aylon. go by yeah. nylon on the internet. <laughs> yeah so he just suggested like how he does it in the DX style as a kind of example of governance uh, so probably we can talk about that and it's kind of open format. So I'll just go through the transparency in general that, uh, yeah. Okay, so ENS, I, we started as a, I think Nick started back in 2016, 17 as while he was in a guest ENS, uh, sorry, the Ethereum guest team. And, uh, but like it, we received a grants from Ethereum Foundation back in 2018, and that lead to spinning up as a new organization called uh, True Names Limited. It's a nonprofit based in Singapore. And so majority of the uh, kind of, yeah, uh, funding come, is based on Ethereum Foundation, but we have received the grants from other organizations such as Binance, Chainlink, Protocol Lab, and the Handshake. Uh, I think Binance and Protocol Lab, that was, aimed for specific implementation that Binance wanted to do the multi coin support. So for that, to aid that, uh, they gave us a grant and the protocol level was more to do is a content hash, uh, like IPFS integration. Whereas I think Chainlink and Handshake is more generic uh, 
grants for supporting our initiative. And for, I think Chain Link and Handshake, we also received some, some of them in like via some of them in coins or something. I don't know the exact figure, but like uh, Bradley and Nick, you can jump in whenever you wanna add things. And uh, that's a uh, base, but also we initially started with a, a lock, like a locking mechanism that like you stake your, uh, your, your ETH as a deposit when you auction for the main, when, when you don't need it, you get the money back. We, that wasn't, didn't really work as a kind of anti-squatting. Uh, when we did it, actually 80% of name didn't even have a ACM address set. So we transitioned to do for a uh, kind of registration renewal model in 2018. And uh, since then, uh, we, we had a base of like a $5 annual fee for most like normal characters. And then we have like about $100 for four, four character and around 500 for the three characters. And uh, also we had a short name auction about a year ago. And also we did, uh, which, which was, uh, uh, I think, uh, auction outsourced by OpenSea. So we did the uh, English kind of normal auction. So we got some revenue. And uh, then also when we said to the permanent registry, uh, we said like after one year, it will expire. And when it comes to expiring, usually in the normal DNS world, it, it allows people to just snatch immediately. So uh, Nick proposed the idea of like, a bit like a Dutch auction model, but like a uh, basically premium uh, expired name comes with uh, some premium and uh, it, it decays to zero over the period of 28 months. That also generated some revenue. So like all the things, uh, it's in on chain. Uh, so like he, I created that dude as dashboard, so you can see here. And uh, in terms of spending, uh, we discussed about op opening up, but like we didn't have like accounting ready. So probably we'll do that in future, but mostly it's like a salary for like staff. We have a member of like, I think active member is about four or five people are working like nearly full time. And then we have a couple of people working kind of part time. And uh, beyond that, we will use it for the bounties, especially like when we did the multi coin support, uh, we put lots of in the bounty, so like uh, uh, to support like over 30 different coins. And also like we, we are regular sponsor of like East Global Hackathons and they use for the price. Uh, that's kind of how, basically how we kind of sustain and how we spend money in general. Uh, any questions? Well, uh, I haven't really seen, I'll just stop it. Uh, is ENS uh, long-term sustainable? Like the that depends a little bit on, um, on the price of Ether. <laughs> um, we're, we're in a pretty good position at the moment. Uh, when the Ether price uh, spiked up to uh, $300, uh, we took out uh, $300,000 worth of Ether from the short name auction um, and turned it into US dollars to pay for our operating expenses, which will uh, should see us for anywhere between about uh, four to six months, depending on uh, you know the varying developer hours and, and bounties and so forth. Um, we're in a pretty good position uh, on the basis of both all the in current registration fees and and what we've got in the sort of backlog from from both that and the short name auctions, um, particularly um, we're not. Uh, I would say that the, the income from registrations at present does not meet our operating expenses, but we have a large buffer, uh, in two, and by which I mean at least a couple of years long uh, at current ETH prices. Yeah. Um, and and, it's, and you know, it's growing. And it's the number of yes, registrations is growing. growing too. So it's yep. going in a good direction. Um, the good thing is we are no longer reliant on grants. Uh, you know, For the first uh, couple of years, really, uh, we were reliant on the direct support mostly of the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, now we are, you know, we're able to, to operate entirely off past and present revenue. So, yeah, I would say I feel very good about the long-term sustainability of VNS right now. Cool. Uh, I think we don't really have any question. I like the auction idea. Yeah. 
Okay, that's just more of a comment. Okay, uh, if there isn't anything, then shall we go to Nick to talk about how Mautic works right now? Yep, um, I guess uh, more broadly, I wanted to talk about our goals for decentralized governance of ENS. Um, and, and presently, as everyone's aware, the ENS route is governed by the multi-sig. Uh, the multi-sig is a four of seven. It's got uh, seven participants from throughout the Ethereum community. We've tried to pick people who are uh, well-known and well-regarded. Um, previously, that was a static membership, uh, but recently, uh, it, you know, with the approval of the, the multi-sig key holders, we've started rotating around uh, members. So every three months, uh, somebody's tenure comes up for expiry, uh, and that person is then replaced by nomination uh, with someone else. Um, we've had two rotations so far, um, and there's no there's no term limit. So if somebody wants to, to re-up, uh, then they're welcome to do so. Um, and our goal behind that is to to keep uh, keep things from sort of stagnating. If you're if you're on uh, a multi sig indefinitely uh, with no recognition, then uh, people's responsiveness naturally suffers. Um, and also to to keep things relevant and to give uh, an opportunity for for many in the community to to be part of this process. Um, we've also implemented a uh, a um, stipend. Uh, for a turn on the multi-sig, uh, we send $1,000 worth of ETH to the, the person who agreed to do it, uh, which doesn't necessarily, uh, isn't necessarily a fair payment, but hopefully at least helps to cover the time they spend uh, assessing uh, and responding to requests. Um, unlike a lot of multi-sigs, uh, the ENS root multi-sig is not simply a mechanism to protect against, uh, against key compromises and so forth. We, we expect multi-seed participants to actually critically assess requested changes and decide for themselves whether they think these are good for ENS uh, in the ecosystem, rather than simply check whether it's a legitimate request and approve it if it is. Um, so we put a larger burden on the, the key holders, but we also hope that provides better guarantees against uh, you know, malicious takeover, against changes that the, the uh, community as a whole wouldn't agree with. You know, we hope that that means that uncontroversial changes get implemented quickly, and that anything more substantial requires, you know, public discussion before the the key holders will will approve it. Um, the our long term goal is to have more decentralised governance than this. The problem, as I see it, is that it, whatever it is needs to be extremely resistant to capture um, and. I haven't seen a mechanism yet that I'm confident is resistant enough to capture that uh, that I would be confident ENS would be safe in its hands. Um, pretty much all the existing proposals are some form of coin voting. Um, aside from needing a way to the problem of needing a way to, to represent stake, um, the issue is that I think they're they're far too vulnerable to somebody buying up a majority share, and with the Damage uh, control over the route could do, um, you know, such as uh, reassigning any arbitrary name um, and ownership of it. Um, I think we need to be extremely cautious about uh, about this. And there's the sort of two approaches we can take to this. Uh, I mean, first of all, we can we can look for better governance mechanisms as as they become available. Um, but first of all, we can limit the control of a decentralized governance system initially. We can we can identify specific levers and switches that that should be able to access and deploy it to the less risky ones or the ones that are uh, less uh, either less subject to take over or um, there is less incentive to do that. Um, and the second thing is we can simply limit what, uh, what the multi-sig or the governance system is able to do in the first place uh, at all. So uh, about six months ago, we deployed a root contract. Um, the root contract now owns the ENS root and the multi-sig owns the root contract. And the reason for this indirection is that the root contract can, amongst other things, uh, enforce constraints that even the multi-sig can't bypass. Uh, specifically for any top level domain, it's possible to toggle a flag that says uh, the, the root and the, the multi-sig and, and whoever owns it can no longer change the ownership of this. 
And the goal there is, uh, particularly for .eth, that at some point in the future we can toggle that flag and it will no longer be possible to upgrade uh, the .eth registrar uh, or change the .eth registrar without redeploying the entire system as we did with the migration. Um, meaning that at that point, people can be sure that whatever actions the multi-sig or the government can take, uh, it will never affect ownership of their domain. Uh, it'll be impossible for the, the root key holders to, to do anything that changes ownership of a, a .eth domain, um, which I think is a good step, but it's also a risky one because doing so means that any uh, showstopper bugs in the .eth registrar would require another migration. Uh, Hadrian asks, does the root contract have a mechanism to transfer ownership of the root domain? Uh, the root domain in ENS is indelibly owned by this root contract, but the ownership of the root contract itself can be transferred to a new one, a new owner. So uh, I guess what I'm interested to hear from participants is uh, what do you think of our current approach? Uh, you know, how we should vary it, and, and are there governance mechanisms that you think are promising? Uh, you know, in the um, you know to, to look at and to to adopt for ENS. Uh, the root contract cannot give the root domain back to the multisig. No, it's it, the the root domain is owned by the root contract forevermore, um, but ownership of the root uh, contract is effectively ownership of the, the root domain with those those constraints. And the reason for this is because if it could be given back, then that flag that prohibits changing a, a top-level domain's owner would be uh, useless because you could always just take control away from the root and then and mess with it as you wish. Um, I know we've got a couple of other presentations, so maybe now that I've gone over how the root is currently managed and what our aspirations are for it, we can go through those and then we can have a sort of a broad discussion at the end as to, to directions and future rather than uh, the whole rest of the session being absorbed in this. Okay, so should I talk about this consortium idea? Actually, uh, yeah. a couple of questions from Rocky and Norman, did we answer these or do we leave it to the end? Uh, oh, sorry. Um, uh, besides registrations, what other streams of revenue are being considered? Um, it's pretty much registrations and renewals. Um, I, we we don't have any intention to to try and uh, you know monetize DNS as we discussed in the previous thing. Uh, basically, the way we see it, we're operating public infrastructure, and it should be operated in the public good. And the income serves first of all and primarily to regulate the system, because uh, uh, if names are free, then squatters would abound, um, and secondarily to help help ensure ENS is sustainable. Um, and as long as that's the case, then I don't think we need to look elsewhere. I think if we did, we would look first to grants rather than, than any additional uh, levies on the users of the system. Um, will we have a standard balance sheet? We're currently trying to sort out our accounting and audits for our first filed tax years uh, in Singapore. Once we have that, I think we'd like to publish as much as we can. Um, and, you know, in the interest of being as transparent as possible, because uh, I think that's helpful for the community to, to, to see what we're doing with the registration fees and, and why. Um, Brantley, yeah, did you also, want to? Yeah, I can talk about the consortium, but I, I just quick comments just on everything the Nick said, which is that, um, we are very specifically think, doing, making decisions about how ENS is set up and things like this, thinking that like ENS is gonna last for decades. So like, we don't wanna do something that like, oh, we maybe get some short-term benefit, but in like three years it falls apart and oh, well, it's a good try. Like, no, 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 we really want ENS to survive like decades and evolve over decades. Um, I would also say, so, so Nick said, there's certain things we can do that, um, once we turn control of something or give up control of something, yes, you can get out of that problem by just redeploying ENS and like moving everybody over to the new system. You can always do that, right? Um, but that is not a easy thing to do. That is hard, which is good. But um, ENS is something that by its very nature has lots of integrations, right? So even now we have 160 in a, uh, different projects integrated with ENS. And if we like have to redeploy, every single one of them have to like change to the new thing, which 
the bigger the number of integrations gets, the harder that is and the more risk there is in that. So like we just did this ENS registry migration because there was a bug in the ENS registry. Um, that was really hard to deal with and we're still small, you know? So like as ENS gets bigger, we, you know, that's really like the nuclear option if there's something really bad. Um, so we don't want to flippantly get ourselves into that situation if we can avoid it. And it, it's worth noting that that is the same power as, as forking the blockchain and that we don't have the power to force everyone to use a new ENS deployment. Uh, you know, we or anyone else can deploy a new deployment to fix a bug, um, but it's up to us to convince everyone who, who would participate that this new one should be considered the canonical one uh, and not the old one. Um, it's not a, a power we have to simply say everyone is now new, using the new contract. Yep. Yeah, Rick Mews, Aren is also awesome protecting us names. People who lose their keys, right, inaccessible forever. That's true. Uh, it gets them back in the system eventually. What are the plans for any excessive income? Great question. Uh, yeah, our plan has been that if the income from DOT ETH registrations or renewals gets more than we need for the running the project, basically, then uh, we'd like to give it out as grants to other people building in the ecosystem. Um, and then if at some point we even exhaust that, I mean, Nick always downplays this and it's because this is unlikely, but there's even been talk of like, could DOT ETH registrations and renewals like fund Ethereum protocol development like sustainably long-term? That would only happen if DOT ETH names became extremely successful. Um, but basically it's, I think of it, we just go out in concentric circles. So it's like the core ENS team, then there's like other people in the ENS ecosystem, and then, you know, things further out from that. Would you agree with that, Nick? Yes. Uh, and one folder that we didn't highlight that's worth mentioning is that uh, with the exception of the short names income uh, from, from the option, uh, all of the all of ENS's income is controlled by the multi-sig key holders. And our understanding with them is that they would... Um, they would approve requests that they think are in the best interest of the ENS ecosystem. So ENS, the organization, does not have direct control over that. And if we want to request funds from them, we have to request it the same as anyone else. Um, you know, clearly we, we expect them to look on our request favorably, but if we simply said, give us the entire treasury now, that's unlikely to be uh, received formally. Um, that also does, however, make life more difficult when it comes to uh, treasury management in that, uh, you know, it's difficult for us to be invested in anything other than Ether, uh, which makes it more difficult to make predictions about how large our runway is because it's so heavily dependent on the price of Ether. There's yeah. Uh, Brownlees. Yeah, it's consortium. Okay, so the idea here is that up until this point, you know, ENS from its conception to now, uh, you know, it was a kind of a small project. It was just a couple people. Then, you know, we had this little organization and all the elements of kind of, you know, maintaining development work, promoting, you know, marketing or business development, all these things were just kind of done by, you know, a small group of people that made the most sense. ENS, especially in the last year has grown a lot in terms of like integration, stakeholders, all these things like this. Um, and so we've had this idea of, of it would be great to have a framework that other people, other organizations that have a stake in ENS and um, that they could have a structure to kind of get more involved in the development and direction of ENS. So we've had this idea, it's still very early kind of draft stage. We haven't pulled the trigger on anything, just been talking to people about it, gauge interest, is to have a, uh, a nonprofit organization that um, then organizations can become members of. And, and in fact, most of our current team would, would create their own organization and they'd become a member so that they're on an equal footing with other member organizations. And then uh, those members uh, could be a part of like development calls. They could have like working groups if there's something that they're particularly interested in. They could have a say on how the funds raised from .eth registrations and renewals are used. Um, and we'd have a more of a community uh, of multiple stakeholders all involved in running it. Uh, we've had interests from, from some organizations on this. Uh, and, uh, but, and we wouldn't do this unless we got, you know, a quorum of good organizations uh, to kind of be founding members. But this is the, 
the the idea. So uh, people's initial rea initial reactions. I'll, I'll just say, some people think this is great. Like, get more people involved. Let's let's create a structure that could scale with more stakeholders. Because right now we don't have that. Um, some other other people have have voiced concern that you know maybe ENS is still kind of too early, and that if we kind of get too complicated, it kind of slows things down or something like this. I think there are pros and cons here. Um, what are people's initial reactions here? Does this seem like a worthwhile thing? Is this a waste of time? What do people think? One thing I'm interested to learn is for the initial people who you got response, such as Microsoft, what exactly they, do they wish to come out of? Like, assume like they pay some sort of membership fee, right? Like, what, what do they want from um, the initiative, joining it? Yeah, so Microsoft has not said they'll definitely join, but they're, they're an organization that's interested. I don't want to name too many names. I don't know, because things are not necessarily super set. But um, yeah, so they pay the membership fee. And then, um, like I said, they would have like a representative dedicated to this. And they'd be a part of development calls. They could have working groups. They could help uh, direct how ENS evolves or make something happen they think is important. Um, so that, and, and they just are supporting maybe a project they think is important. But like the, mem the members who are going to pay are gonna also, also vote on decisions, right? So in, in this case, how is it different than many other, you know, TL existing TLDs in the governance if you just have a bunch of uh, corporates affecting the decisions? So I think the, the key distinction here is between um, uh, directing the development of ENS as a standard and a technology and governance of the ENS deployment on mainnet. And I think uh, Brantley's goal is to build an organization around technical standardization, not to hand over control of the, the route to uh, a coalition of large companies. How, how do we kind of, is it divide or, so my concerns I get, I think the ETH domain and the DNSSEC domain has a very different interest that the ETH is kind of symbol of decentralization. Whoever wants the ETH are kind of promoting Ethereum, whereas DNSSEC is more fits into traditional enterprise who could use as a PKI infrastructure structure. So, and I'm assuming it, unless they are crypt companies, they will be even, so like, you know, the interests are different between the dot ETH domain and the dot non dot ETH domain. And uh, by having this kind of stuff, how would you, and also like, it, how does it fit with it? It sounds like it's very top down membership approach. And also there's another way of like, you know, community or anything to do with community voting is more grassroots. And how do they fit together? Do they equal or because they pay membership, do they, do they have like over ruling power, uh, like, you know, over this community effort? So I, so right now, obviously ENS is a, is an open source project. So technically anybody can contribute anything, can do anything they want. That's like already the case, right? Whether you're just an individual by yourself or an organization. Um, and all, by the way, in this consortium, uh, the plan would be that even uh, individuals could join. Uh, like if they're just like an individual developer or researcher or something like this. Um, it's just more like creating a formalized framework for people to sort of do what they kind of already could do to some degree. Um, just to encourage more people to get involved uh, and then create a structure for, for how you do that. Because like right now people are like, oh, they want to get involved. It's like, well, I don't know, start poking around our GitHub or something like that. Um, we're on our forum and that's fine and that's fine. And this just kind of creates another avenue, I guess, in my mind for that. Uh, just to say, like, on the last thing you just said, um, if you want to get more people involved in contributing, I, I mean, like, the solution you're proposing is, I think, is a different problem. Uh, and here you could 
I mean, it could start with like weekly calls, weekly dev calls, um, and you know, these type of things to actually incentivize or, or, you know, bring people to contribute. I don't know if, you know, let's say governance is exactly that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it will affect that for sure. But yeah, it's not that problem. Yeah, and I think currently we have a bit of problem of lack of participation that our community channel, like discussion forum, NOAA, like a chat channel is not that active. So before we ask people to pay the privilege to engage, we don't have engagement. <laughs> Uh, to be brutally honest. Uh, so one, the, the, another question would be, yeah, how, I think before we start asking for money, like how we increase would be probably another problem to solve. If we just create a membership, like why would people join when they are not even joining? Like they don't join even if it's free, right? Currently, whoever uh, shouts on the discussion forum gets best attention. Uh, I wonder how do we encourage more, and uh, do that also could lead to like you know all these like governance crazy on the DeFi space. It is kind of fashion; they it might go disappear, but there are organizations who build a solid engagement, and. Uh, when Nick talked about uh, like anything to do with coin voting, like you know, people try to incentivize but uh, to incentivize for their own benefit. But are there any other way we could use governance to increase the engagement rather than just like you know making the decision? I think I, I think it's worth uh, bearing in mind that structure has a big impact on participation. Um, I mean, as you observe, our discussion forum is relatively quiet, although our um, uh, you know, chat channel is a lot more active now. It's been now you've migrated it to Discord. Um, but we have a lot of active participants here in these calls because we provided some structure that people could, could feel they could usefully contribute around. And I think Brantley's goal with the consortium is to provide that sort of structure towards the ongoing development of, of ENS, um, that we can, you know, provide a more structured situation in which it's, uh, people can, can usefully contribute and expect other people's contributions, and that that should uh, provide an environment where we get more active involvement in the ongoing development. Uh, there's also the sense that if you can have an actual impact, you're more inclined to, to put your effort into, into it. Yeah, so I think it's, yeah, if there's like a proposal saying like if you're an individual or an organization, you want to get involved right now, it's very nebulous how that, how that works. Like you just, you can, but it's nebulous. Whereas if we have a structure say, here's what the kind of proposal of how to do that, more people uh, I think will do that. And in fact, in terms of the cost, I actually think having, um, we, we could have like maybe membership without costs, but I think it creates actually something of a nothing at stake problem. Um, and I think actually if people have to pay something, then it's like they're actually more likely to remain involved because they're, they're, it's costing them something. So I actually think that actually encourages participation. And I will say um, this isn't just entirely theoretical. So again, I don't want to uh, name names, but I have talked to significant organizations that because I proposed the structure, they are interested and, I, and, and have said tentatively yes that they actually would, I think then that would, they would be much more involved than in ENS as a result of this than they are currently where it's very nebulous, they're not really sure, they don't really get credit for it. Um, so actually, I think that this would greatly increase participation. So uh, I got one question. Because, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. So I, I would chime in with, the, with some examples from the DNS world. I mean, ENS has become a member of DNS ORG which is the DNS Operations Research and Analysis Center. And uh, that is a group where everybody pays a membership and basically the members meet and tell each other what they're doing with DNS. Uh, but they also get access, gray... excuse me, sorry. They also yeah. get access to a bunch of like data sets and the day yeah. in the life of the internet. And so it's not like yeah. it's just yes. a free. No, 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 but, but you know, it's, 
the, the, the great value in it is that we get information about DNS from other members. And, and that is something that DNS can provide to others. And I think there is a lot of organizations that would be interested in ENS, but they don't know how to go about it. And they need to meet other organizations that have done it and to provide it in, in a structured form for that. Is yeah, I will say I, I'm partly what? inspired by what I've seen with, with DNS OARC. It's very impressive. And there's other examples, obviously. And James is correct that there are like special data things. And I mean, you know, we're thinking through right now, like what, what can, can be offered by an organization like this? Um, and that's evolving over time. Um, but yeah, no, I, th yeah, I think that there's, when you provide a, it's like, yeah, like these meetings, like could people just like have, decide to spontaneously have video chats or something? I mean, yes, but nobody did. I mean, we just, we set it up, we kind of put a schedule, the structure, and then people can cut, you know, now we have the, we have the participation. So I think the structure helps. I mean, so it seems to me that it's quite difficult to make such a consortium, but you say you are in the process. Uh, if, if you do, I mean, so what's the con of it? I mean, what, what happens, what is there to lose if such a thing exists? It seems to me that if I'm not a member, I can still do everything that I do anyway, because it's open source and I can always contribute. So what's the con for having such a thing if you do manage to actually establish that? Yeah, so um, we would maybe have like chat groups that like members are a part of. And again, it's like limiting maybe those to members. Again, sort of ensures a level of participation or, or a level of value, right? So it's like, okay, if you're really serious about ENS, you pay the little fee thing, you, you know, you commit a person to it, you get to be a part of maybe these private chat groups or something like this. Maybe we have certain meetings that only you can come to. Again, there's other public stuff too. Uh, yes, technically everything's still open source. We can still have contributors, but maybe we have uh, places that are just for the members. Um, and then um, things like that. And then also, um, I mentioned we'd want them to have uh, a say over the use of the of the uh, dotty th registration renewal funds. So, like only members would have a say over that, you know, because they they're contributing. They have a, something at stake, um, and basically giving that as grants out to to who who is most worthy for that. Uh, shall we move on to the next topic? Then we can, if we have time, we can talk about generic discussion. You don't you want to go? Uh, yeah, sure. What's up, guys? Um, so I'm Elon. Uh, I work for DAO Stack. I'm a member of DXDAO. Uh, I've been uh, I've been in love with the concept of DAO since the DAO hack. That's what drew me to Ethereum. It took me a while to actually, um, you know, quit everything and join. But yeah, um, I want to present basically the DXDAO uh, governance structure, and I think that uh, this is something that could work fairly well for ENS. Um, so let me start by sharing my screen. Um, who here knows about the Excel? I don't know, raise your hands. Oh, wait, where did you go? Uh, I didn't see any hands because it just, I started screen sharing and it just went crazy. Yeah, okay. Um, so the Excel is a pretty interesting organization. It's, it's actually decentralized and um, yeah, it's one of these organizations that are uh, what I call decentralization purists. There aren't many of these in the ecosystem. Um, and just like to start this off, I think Nick talked about uh, token voting being bad. And, you know, I completely agree. Like this is going to blow up in the face of most of these protocols who are actually going to decentralize it. Um, and um, another thing to agree with what Nick said, I think uh, decentralization should be gradual. And if let's say we open an ENS DAO tomorrow, then uh, first would be kind of like governing a small amount of funds and then maybe something in the protocol and then moving, moving slowly and gradually to uh, actually governing, I don't know, the ENS uh, root contract. Um, so, yeah, um, the system that DXDAO uses is DAO Stack Alchemy. Um, it's basically, um, it's, it's designed for governance at scale. Uh, DXDAO has, uh, so this is what it kind of looks like. DXDAO has over 400 members. Uh, each one of them have reputation. Uh, reputation is um, the way to vote and reputation is a non-transferable token. Um, oh, by the way, if there are any questions, feel free to stop me. Um, like at any time, because um, I'll just like breeze through this. 
Um, at the end of the day, when, you have, when you're dealing with these type of large communities, it kind of follows the internet rule of the 1%, where you know, for every thousand members, you will have 10 members that will actually uh, create value, and then maybe uh, uh, 90 that will uh, engage with the, uh, with the content, and then the other 900 will be completely uh, lurkers. Um, the way it works here is that, um, um, yeah, basically, uh, your reputation determines uh, how much voting power you have. So, you know, the top member here has like 9% of uh, the voting power, which is fairly a lot, let's say. Um, the way uh, proposals get passed is uh, uh, basically through holographic consensus, which I will not get into, but um, it's, it's basically through a relative majority, uh, as long as someone is staking on a certain proposal. And as you can see in the DixDAO, um, they have various different proposals. This is like a worker uh, payout. They employ uh, uh, people in full time. Uh, here's like a rep boost because I've done some work. So someone else wanted to give me uh, some reputation. Um, I wanted to touch on, yeah. So like this is a proposal to ratify a manifesto, uh, the manifesto of the DXDAO. Uh, um, what it's about, what it, what's it doing, etc. cetera. Um, the question of uh, reputation itself, how do you get reputation? How do you, uh, uh, how do you accumulate it is, is an interesting one. Yeah, we have a couple of examples. In DXDAO, there was like a bootstrap event about uh, a year and a half ago, where you would lock various different tokens to get reputation. That was kind of like the initial bootstrap. And now they have, um, they have a full worker compensation gu guidelines with um, basically level of, uh, of uh, participation, both for um, how much money you get for working, let's say full time for the DAO, and um, how much reputation you would get every month for working for the DAO. Um, uh, yeah, um, another kind of like bootstrap uh, examples is the neck DAO. In the neck DAO, you lock nectar tokens uh, for an extended period of time and for these nectar tokens you get reputation um, in the example of ENS let me just kind of like brainstorm something anyone who's ever bought an ENS domain will get airdropped you know a certain amount of reputation uh, the uh, let's say the multi-sig holders right now could have like a bigger portion amount bigger portion of reputation and that's a way to kickstart it I think that's kind of worked with um, Uniswap the retroactive airdrop type thing. Um, and yes, um, the way decisions are being made in the DAO, uh, there are a couple of ways. It's either sort of like a yes or no question. Basically someone makes a proposal and it's a yes or no. Another option is to create a competition, which is basically a best uh, M of N. Anyone could make, uh, once you pass uh, a proposal, anyone could suggest a solution and then anyone from the DAO can vote on it. And this could be used to elect roles, for example. Maybe the DAO wants to pick every three months who will, be, uh, who will govern the ENS uh, route or you know, something of that sort. Um, yeah, the DIGS DAO, I, I don't know how many people know, but it, the DIGS DAO governs a few, um, a few DeFi protocols. This is Omen. Um, there's a few others, uh, there's about, they're about to launch, uh, uh, Uniswap, uh, fork basically with, with actual governance and yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's fairly easy to create any blockchain interaction. Um, uh, yeah, this is, I don't know, kind of how it looks like this is the DAO holdings 21, almost 22 K ETH, pretty nice. Um, so yeah, I don't know any questions. Does this makes sense. A question uh, is, are there any malicious activity to game the system? Um, I'm sure, I mean, th they can try, but at the end, this is a DAO that holds, you know, over $10 million. Um, I think there were like, you can make a proposal to give all the funds from the DAO to yourself, but you know, what will happen after that is that I will probably downvote this proposal and then vote to slash all your reputation. Uh, so I had a question on, 
on yeah. um so you said you airdrop rep to each say person in ens that has ever registered a name you said they're non-transferable or yeah. they are transferable they're non-transferable like basically the dao it's not even a token it's basically a value held by the dao that you know balance of and it has a list of all reputation holders so like when you start the dao um so the DAO is the only thing that can, you know, either mint or slash reputation. So you start it uh, with a list of reputation holders, which theoretically could be anyone who's ever interacted with TNS. So how would you say limit the power of, um, say, I don't know, a squatter that has put in a lot of F into buying a bunch of names. Uh, we can't really know whether these are different people or not. Maybe they're, they're using lots of different accounts. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we can like dive deeper into how would you um, actually airdrop it in, in a more decent way. Um, you could also do some like opt in and anyone who wants to can get, you know, that initial amount of reputation. And interesting, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like shooting from the hip here, but an interesting thing to start with, it could be like ENS govern has 50% of, of the reputation to start with. The rest of the community has another 50%. And as time moves on, you know, the NS team gives up, gives most of the reputation to the community or like the community inflates the reputation in their favor uh, as you work, as you do things for the DAO. If that makes sense, yeah. So how would reputation be gained post airdrop? Would it be solely through uh, approved requests? Sorry, again, I didn't hear the beginning of the question. How would reputation be gained post airdrop? Yeah, so um, it's basically through the whatever guidelines that you decide. So for worker proposals, you would get an X amount of reputation. For um, contributing in a certain way, you would get an X amount of reputation. Um, yeah, it's basically by whatever guidelines like you choose. And it's kind of like it's via a proposal. So someone will actually have to ask it for themselves or you know, grant it to someone else. It's like the blockchain version of a, co of a cooperative, right? Exactly. Okay. So it seems like it would be difficult to get a quorum on some of these. Like how many key holders, are or how many uh, rep owners are going to be invested in making sure that um, Makoto gets paid the reputation for his last week's work? Yeah, so... No, no, uh, yeah, yeah, so the, the way this works is that... Um, if you get 50% of the reputation voting, then obviously the proposal passes immediately. Um, but if it doesn't, then you have kind of like another layer of a prediction market uh, on top of this, basically put your money where your mouth is uh, and uh, staking or predicting that a proposal will pass. Like for example, here, you know, someone predicted 2000 uh, gen that it will pass. We'll move it up in the UI. And this is uh, also to, uh, basically direct the attention because what happens if you have a thousand proposals in the DAO? How does the DAO mem how do the DAO members know what their attention should be allocated to? Um, and then uh, it basically creates a bottleneck around uh, which proposals should be decided on first. And as they move to basically the boosted section, um, the proposals will be are decided by relative majority. Um, so the thing is with DAOs, and I and uh, this is. Just to be like fully transparent, 90% probably of the governance is being done off chain in telegram groups, in the forums and you know, in various other things. It's just the ratification that's being done on the DAO itself. And so by the time usually that a proposal reaches the DAO, it will either pass or um, usually you would get the most amount of participation and the highest percentage of voting when there's some, you know, uh, a proposal that there's a lot of disagreement on. Um, so yeah. Cool. Uh, we have a few minutes. Oh, thank you very much for you for presenting the Excel. Uh, we have a couple minutes left. Do you guys have anything, some burning question or body, some topic you wanna especially discuss or get answered by Ines team? I wonder, or shall we start reading questions on the chat?
I have uh, one comment. Um, it, it, it does go the direction of some sort of coin vote. And Nick, you mentioned uh, capture is really important to avoid. Um, and obviously forking is, is like the end all be all mechanism to avoid capture or if something does get captured. Um, would it make sense to add uh, functionality to make it easier to fork ENS? Um, I, I know Augur has like a snapshot method uh, with their token so that they can easily fork into different universes that they call it. Uh, I'd imagine ENS names could also be snapshotted to make uh, ENS easy to fork. Yeah, my, my concern with forking is that it doesn't really work so well for a naming system um, because you, if you have a universe where different uh, different wallets and dApps and users resolve to different versions of the naming system, you have a maximum opportunity for, uh, for both accidental confusion and for people to maliciously register domains on different forks in order to, to misdirect funds and so forth. So um, I think... Uh, Forking is something that we we need to avoid for ENS to the greatest degree possible, um, and you know it provides us a strong incentive to to play nicely, um, but I don't think it really works here. I think we're out of time, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, anything else? I'll just wait five seconds. So anyone want to ask a final question, just give a shout. Five, four, three, two, one. Sarah, okay, so we're going to have a last session in the next 10 minutes. So we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you.